kind of partner with a little bit in the past. They recently relocated to a different building kind of due to rental aspects that needed to change. And uh, they are now Ark Bible Church. And uh, so pastor has an opportunity to go over there and just speak and be an encouragement and uh, um, great opportunity to be able to do that this morning. And I get the pleasure to be able to preach today. Um, yesterday is Saturday, which means college football. And uh, if you like college football and you were from Oregon, yesterday was probably a disappointment for you. If you like college football and you're from Washington and a Huskies fan, I was not disappointed last night. Um, but uh, again, to each his own in that. Uh, I was thinking, though, along those lines of football, there exists in almost every church a ministry position or ministry team that is very similar to a kicker in football. What I mean by that, and I was actually talking with is Bonnie in here, Bonnie Bryce. Okay, it doesn't matter. She, she'd be all right if me sharing this news. Talking to Bonnie Bryce, she's a huge Minnesota Vikings fan, and uh, Minnesota lost a few weeks back because a kicker missed a very easy field goal kick. Sorry, Steve. Okay. Uh, and her exact words were, you have one job. Okay, we, we hear that often. They get paid to kick field goals, extra points, and when they miss it, people notice, and I think that guy actually got let go from the team after that, okay? So it's a, a pretty serious thing, okay? Well, that, that one position in the church, and I'm blessed that our church, this rarely happens, rarely, is soundboard or projection. It's kind of a, a team thing. When something goes wrong, you guys have, we've probably all done this just instinctively, you turn back, you know, maybe the audio's not turned on, the, the slides haven't transitioned, you notice something, you hear something, and it's, what are they doing up there? Okay, that's kind of the, the, the first thought. When something goes wrong, you notice it right away. Uh, even, you know, a pastor up front, I'm not saying from a spiritual standpoint, responsibility-wise, that it's insignificant because teachers are judged even more severely, okay? But uh, I, I could mess up sometime, you know, speaking in that, and you might just chalk that up for something else. It might be excused, even magician or magicians, musicians up here, uh, you know, they, they can get away with some stuff in there. But for some reason, soundboard projection is one of those that uh, when something goes wrong, people notice, and it, you know, it's a big deal. Well, when I uh, was about 15 years old, at the church I grew up at, at Southside Baptist Church up in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, I was asked by one of the older guys in our youth group if I wanted to start learning how to do soundboard. And I was excited because I got to hang out with Kenny, who was a good friend of mine, and he was teaching me how to do it. And uh, it also allowed me to build a control knobs and have a lot of power within the church. Okay, uh, That's probably one of the most exciting things. There's flashy things that you get to move, and it's pretty fun. So I'm doing that. And things go well for a couple of weeks, a couple months even. And then the dreaded day comes where I'm there, I'm paying attention and doing everything, and something happens. And to this day, I have no idea what it was. And you get the words from uh, our pastor at the time, Ronald Hill, and he says, uh, Marcus, is there something going on with the audio? And I'm scrambling. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I have no idea. And so Kenny runs to the back and does something. I think we ended up having to reset the whole system before it actually worked, so I felt a little better about myself. But that was my, my first exposure to a ministry role within our church, was doing soundboard. I eventually did worship team on Sunday nights, and I don't know why I did that. I think I, I felt, uh, you know, I should, but someone asked me. But uh, um, that was my, my first exposure to that. Um, we are going to be talking for the next two weeks about this idea of ministry. Okay. If you remember our, our overarching series that we started a couple weeks back is we are created for certain things within our Christian life. And as we grow in these areas, these topics that we're focusing on become kind of a measuring rod for us to know, am I really growing in my faith? We talked the last two weeks about this idea of worship and how worship is foundational in our relationship with God. If we are going to grow we need to grow in that area of worship. We are created to worship. Uh, our next topic, and again, we're going to progress through this with a couple other topics, is this idea of ministry. And so as we get started, I just want to make sure we have a solid under idea, understanding and idea of what ministry is, and then we'll look at what Scripture says um, about how we live that out. 
So in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, the word for ministry is diokinia. Diokinia, and really the, the main idea behind that, the uh, definition of that is, again, to serve, to provide, to contribute, uh, even that idea of waiting upon, not in a sense of a time standpoint, but waiting upon in a service and a ministering sense. Uh, those are the, the main uses. It's used 21 times in the New Testament as ministry. Uh, so Diocene is translated as ministry 21 times. Eight times as service, four times as serve or serving, two times as relief, and one time as distribution. The, the thing, though, with this word is it's used in many different contexts. Okay? We have a uh, context where it's used to describe an individual and their personal ministry. Okay? Uh, if you look at Acts 20, 24, again, it says, the ministry that I received. Uh, Acts 21, 19 says, his ministry. Again, both of these describing individuals who are entrusted with the ministry from God that was specific to them. Okay? It also, though, describes collective ministries. Okay? So it's not just an individual. It's multiple people involved in that ministry together. 2 Corinthians 5.18 uh, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, not just one person, but we know that is the ministry that the church as a whole is given. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.3 also uses that term. It's our ministry, not just an individual, but a collective effort. Uh, elsewhere, it's also used to describe a, a specific type of ministry, okay? Uh, ministry of the word, and I'm not going to have a lot of references because there's so many. There's even ministry of death, of life, of reconciliation, ministry of the spirit, okay? There's so many different examples of a specific type of ministry. Uh, lastly, too, we see that uh, it can be used even just in a general sense, okay? Okay. Uh, our passage we're going to look at primarily today, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Okay, it's not specific, it's not defined, it's just in a general sense, the work of ministry. The context directly dictates what that understanding of that is. I, I say all that because I want us to get a good idea of what do we mean when we talk about this topic of ministry. Now, you have a definition, I believe, in your notes, and would just kind of work with this but as we go forward, here's what our understanding is going to be when we use this word. Okay? It is the holistic effort of an individual or a group to contribute to the needs of others. The reason why I'm very specific in the word choice is that is it's a holistic effort. Okay? We're not going to lump up and say ministry is just your physical exertion. It's more than that. Ministry isn't just your spiritual exertion. It's not just your mental or emotional or financial exertion. It is your holistic effort as an individual or when you think of the context of the church and being a called to a ministry, it is our holistic effort to contribute. Okay? When we say to the needs of others, we're not just talking to an individual or even to an entity. It could be, again, in a general sense. We are holistically using all that God has given us for a cause, for a specific purpose, for an individual. It goes on and on. Yes? Holistic is all-encompassing. It's comprehensive. It's not just one thing. It is all. In that. Okay? So in that sense, physical would be one aspect. Holistic includes multiple aspects of that. Good clarification. Thanks, Brian. Um, so when we, we think about that definition and what we're going to talk about, the next two weeks we're going to talk about ministry. Today we're going to focus on ministry in the context of the church. And next week we're going to talk about ministry in the context outside of the church. So ministry as we understand it on how it works between brothers and sisters in Christ and using our gifts to bless the church as a whole. And next week again, ministry in using all of that, what we are to contribute to the needs of people outside of the church. Uh, our, our main passage the next two weeks, that's kind of our big picture passage, is Ephesians 2.10. Uh, we've talked about this before, um, but uh, again, just this foundational verse that says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. As we get ready to jump into our main passage, just from a foundational standpoint, we want to understand why this verse is significant for us. Okay? Just generally speaking, this verse emphasizes our lives are all about God and not me. Okay? Just basic takeaways from that verse. We are His workmanship. Okay? We talked already about how that makes us unique and special and how that gives us value, and that's all true, but the reality is we're his workmanship. He's the one who was here before us. He's the one who created us. He's the one who created us, as the verse goes on, for a specific purpose and reason. Okay, and That reason is to do good works, which even before we were here, God had already prepared what those works were going to be in advance. So as we think about this whole topic of ministry, I want us to have just this heart of humility as we go into that. That it's about God, it's not about me. He is the creator, I am the creation. He is the one who has established what his desire is for the church to be. How do I fit into that desire? So I have a question for you, and we don't do this often, but uh, we're going to do it this morning. Uh, I want you to talk to someone next to you. Okay. If you don't know the person, that's okay. If you do, that's also okay. But talk to someone next to you, even if it's in, you know, two or three people. And here's the question I want you to ask. Okay. When it comes to ministry, you remember what our definition was? You have it in your notes. Okay. How concerned is God about our preferences and desires? When it comes to ministry, how concerned is God about our preferences and our desires? So I'm going to give you uh, maybe three minutes, and I want you to talk to someone around you. And again, if you have a hard time reading that, I apologize. I'll read it one more time. When it comes to ministry, how concerned is God about our preferences and desires? I release you to talk to the people next to you, all right? All right, one more minute, one more minute, all right. Right. Thank you for uh, being willing to, to do that. And you thought you were going to come to church and just not talk to anybody. Well, joke is on you this morning, all right? Um, how we answer that question, I think, is very significant. And here's why. We could go to two extremes with that, 
Okay? We could go to one extreme and have a view of God that uh, he desires his children, the church, to function exactly in this sugar-cut mold. And uh, this is exactly what I'm going to do. And I don't really care what you care about. I'm just going to place you in here. Okay? I'm going to throw you in the lot, get in line with where you're going to go. As long as the stuff gets done, that's all that God cares about. Okay? We could have an extreme view in that sense. We could go to the other extreme, however, and think that uh, God's first priority is to put you in ministry where you desire to be at. And it becomes more about, yeah, that sounds exciting to me. That sounds beneficial to me. That sounds like something I can get on board with as opposed to, God, where do you want me to serve at in our church? How do you want to use what you've given to me in the first place in your hands. And I think really, whatever, you know, and I'd love to be able to have one-on-one conversation and kind of ask where you guys are at in that, but we really do need to have, we talk about this often, that balanced perspective that we understand that God does care about our desires. There are specific gifts and roles, and we'll talk about that briefly this morning, but at the same time, as our main passage, Ephesians 2.10 says, God is the one who created us. We are his workmanship. He's established what those works are going to be. And ultimately, he has the final authority to place us where he wants to place us. We have to hold both of those perspectives truthfully as equals. And as we think about, again, what is this topic of ministry, of contributing with all that I am to the needs of others? And obviously, God's the one who directs what that looks like specifically. So we think about how that fleshes itself out in our church. Where is our heart attitude at the base of all of that? Okay, Are we going to give God the, the freedom, again, we use this often, to position us where he desires, Okay, not in a way that is insensitive or we just have this God who doesn't care about our preferences and desires, but one that we recognize ultimately it is up to. So I want to start with that because, I, and even just now, if you want to pray with me as I'm praying in my head, that, that our heart would be humble as we approach this, that he does get that authority, he does get that right, and uh, we get the privilege of living under that. Uh, our, our main passage this morning as we focus on ministry within the body of Christ, ministry in the church, is going to be Ephesians chapter 4. So I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at verses 11 through 16 this morning. And uh, this is going to be where we'll spend the remainder of our time. So Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And the reason why I chose this passage for us to focus on is I think this passage gives us a solid understanding of what ministry in the church looks like and how it can make our church, our body here in Newport, move to a healthier place. How we can put this into practice and get to the place that God would desire for us to be at. So Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 11 through 16. I believe we have the text on the screen. You're welcome to follow there or on your own uh, Bibles. Um, But uh, we're going to read this together. Ephesians 4 verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ." from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And if we're going to understand that, first of all, we're created for ministry, this is one of those things that as followers of Jesus, we need to take this seriously, we need to put this into practice. And as we're focusing this morning on what ministry within the church looks like, again, if we want our church to be healthy in how we practice this, 
one of the first things I think this passage instructs us to do is that we understand how we should function. Okay? A healthy church in this area of ministry understands how they should function, and when they're actually doing that, that brings about health. We look at verses 11 and 12. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Okay? So if we need to understand uh, what the different functions are within the body of Christ, we need to understand what our roles are. I don't know if you've ever done this in your past, but uh, often, you know, sometimes we do it in youth groups, sometimes we've done it elsewhere. We will take spiritual gift inventories or assessments, okay? It's kind of a fun thing. Sometimes they can be a little lengthy, but uh, you kind of go through a survey of questions asking, you know, where you've served at, what your desires, your gifts, your skills are, and uh, comparing that to what we see in Scripture about the different spiritual gifts and how we see in 1 Corinthians 14 and Romans 14 and other passages that really describe that, uh, what, uh, what those things are. Um, really, I think this passage simplifies it for us. We see kind of two main groups here. We see in verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. It's kind of one group to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Kind of have two groups, and we could definitely take this the wrong way, but I think one of these groups, the first group that verse 11 characterizes for us, are those who are more in that primary leadership role. Yeah, some would, commentators even say, you know, this is more of the, the vocal gifts, the ones who are more teaching and, uh, you know, speaking oriented, whereas the saints are more so those who are kind of the hands and feet of the ministry itself. And I don't think that's incorrect, but really this idea of apostles, of evangelists, of teachers, of shepherds, of prophets, okay, these are those who God has put into a position where they are encouraging in speaking God's truth to others. They are equipping and enabling them to also live out their faith. And one of the main reasons why this is so important that we understand our roles is because when we don't, it can lead to discouragement, it can lead to frustration, and more often than not, the biggest thing, it can lead to inaction. Okay, when you are in a church and you have no idea, how do I fit in? How do I use what God has given to me? How do I, uh, again, make sure that I am contributing to what is going on here? If I don't have an idea of what God has equipped me for and what the role is that he would desire for me, it's going to be frustrating. It's going to be discouraging. It is going to lead to inaction. And so we think first and foremost that, uh, again, we need to understand our roles. Okay. How do we do this? I mentioned doing the, the spiritual gift assessments. That can be a good tool. But I think we need to look at what Scripture says these gifts are. Um, we could look at, again, in verse 11, apostles. Okay? This is one that uh, is a little bit more controversial. What do we understand apostleship to be? Really, the word a synonym for that is a messenger of God. That they are those who God has put into that position where God speaks through them. They deliver the message that God wants them to. And they have a unique position in that. Okay? We look at that word uh, prophets. Again, similar to apostles, but maybe in a more general sense, those who speak truth to others. Those who can look at your life and can have this idea, this is what God wants me to say to you. This is what you need to hear right now. Look at the word uh, evangelist. Again, this is one I think we have to be very careful of. Every single person who has a relationship with Jesus is called to share their faith. You should never think that evangelists who have that spiritual gift, they are the only one who should speak about Jesus to people who don't know Christ. If we ever get to that place, we totally misunderstand Scripture. But instead of evangelists, and it makes even more sense in this context, they are those who not only are gifted in sharing their faith, but they help other people to know how to share their faith. They help other people and to train them up and to encourage them, sometimes through example and sometimes through speaking and training them, to go forward and to proclaim the gospel. We think of teaching and preaching, and obviously those are uh, shepherds and teaching, I should say. Uh, those are primarily ones we 
tend to attribute to kind of that pastoral role in the church, that they are shepherds, they're teaching. That could look different, you know, maybe in a Sunday school class or a small group leader. But the, the similarity that all of these first five gifts that are mentioned in this verse is that their focus is really on, again, equipping and training other people. Okay? It's enabling and bringing up others around them to help them get to a place where they are also contributing to the body of Christ. So if we want to lump those up and say these are more leadership positions or vocal, you know, word type positions, we, we could categorize it that way. But the main heart is that they are helping others get to a place where they are using their gifts. And so if we are going to function according to our gifts, we need to make sure that those who are in that leadership position are actually equipping other people. Here's why that's important. Sometimes we get this perspective that the, and I'll just use a practical example, that the pastor who does everything at the church, okay, they are, we use this word in Sunday school, they're kind of the spiritual busybody that's justified in that role, okay? And we come, sometimes get that idea that, man, they are just, they're doing God's work. They're busy all the time. They're constantly serving, constantly doing this. Okay, is that really the best measure of using their gift in the way God intended? I think if we look at this passage, the best measure of someone who's in this type of leadership role isn't doing all the work themselves. It's equipping and preparing other people to also join in and participate in the ministry. This is, in some ways, a big paradigm shift. If we really took this to the, the end of what it could look like, that as a church, those who are in leadership, even on our elder board, if our main focus wasn't necessarily on doing all the hands-on aspects, but completely equipping, raising up, and training other people in our church to partner and join in to do the work, the hands and feet of the church, as opposed to just doing it ourselves, because sometimes that's easier. It would shift that. And really, that is a greater measure of success and obedience to Scripture than just being a busybody going about doing that if you're in a leadership-type role. Okay. What does it say, though, for uh, the saints, those who maybe aren't in that? You know, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, uh, you know, I do not believe I have the gift of preaching or teaching, uh, you know, that idea of evangelism and helping train other people and how to share their faith, you know, that doesn't really, you know, I, I'm not in that situation. So if you're here and you feel like, you know, I fit more in the line of the, the saints. I'm one of those who I have a spiritual gift. I am used by God, but maybe not in that primary setting example uh, position. What you are called to do is, again, to do the work of ministry. What does that mean? If you're sitting here. If I'm a saint, I'm supposed to do this. What is the work of ministry? As we mentioned before, that's a kind of general description. Okay, what are the specifics? We'll get to that in this passage. Okay? Here's why I think, though, this is important. We need to understand our role. We need to understand how we fit into that. But we have to realize everybody in the church, everybody who has a relationship with Christ is called to something. Everybody. There's no exception. So this perspective of being a, a bystander or being on the sidelines... It's two football illustrations this morning. I'm on a roll. Um, that, uh, that is foreign, and honestly, that's something that I think God would, <laughs> we're missing it at that point. We're missing what he has for us. No matter what the position, no matter what the gifting, no matter what the role, we are all fully involved and need to be fully contributing to that. Okay. So what is the work of the ministry? The passage goes on and I think speaks to that. At the end of verse 12, it says, To equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. And then verses 13 and 14 really, again, give some specific details on what that ministry needs to be. Uh, if you look at verse 13, it says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's four things that are, are listed here that I think fit into that category of the work of ministry. If the leadership roles are supposed to equip the saints and the saints are the ones who are supposed to be the hands and feet of that ministry, here's the goal, here's the, 
the destination and what we need to strive for. Okay? In some ways, as we think about what does ministry in our church look like, these need to be the things that we measure what our ministries consist of. These need to be the things that we're always going back to and thinking, does it focus and drive towards these aspects? Okay? First thing that it mentions is that we need to uh, attain to the unity of the faith. That we do the work of ministry until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Okay? Unity is one that we, we have that ideal of, okay, we need to get along with each other. We need to be committed to each other. We can't just walk out on each other when things get difficult. We need to be focused on being in on this together. But the bigger aspect behind unity is that there are differences. There are distinctions. There are different even beliefs within our church. And the reality is unless it's a foundational issue, unless it's something that is incompatible, that we, we have to agree on certain things. There's other things that are, you know, ulterior aspects that we are in this together. We are different, but we're together, and we're committed to that. One of the main reasons why that is so important is John 13, 35. By this will all men outside of the church know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. If we're not showing love and purposeful commitment through unity with one another, how are we supposed to demonstrate to the world that we are actually disciples of Christ? We have to be in that together. It doesn't mean that we're all the same. It doesn't mean that there's not challenges or difficulties, but that we are committed and unified in what we pursue and go after. So unity of the faith, that we are, again, together in that and striving to the same purpose. The next thing it says is uh, unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. How do we contribute to a ministry that is focused on pursuing knowledge of the Son of God? I was thinking about this this week that I think in our culture in particular, we have this tendency to really elevate, I want to have a practical faith. I want to have a faith that fleshes itself out, really radically changes my actions. Okay? And that is 100% true, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think behind that perspective, sometimes there's this idea that we discount the significance of theology and doctrine. I want a faith that changes how I live, but the beliefs behind that maybe aren't quite as significant. Let me be honest with you, that is a huge lie. Okay? We can't divorce those two things together. If we try to do the actions of what a Christian should look like at the expense of believing correctly about who Jesus Christ is and of what Scripture is about, again, we're going to end up at this place where we might look good and we might look like a moral person, but we're doing it for completely the wrong reasons. We have to grow in knowing and having knowledge of the Son of God. Again, if we do not focus in our church, and I'm very grateful that I think we do have great Bible-centered teaching that is focused on knowing God correctly, but if we discount, why is that important in the first place? And we simply focus on, I want to make sure we're just doing the right things. Again, we can't separate those out. We need to have both of those in place. The next one, it says, mature manhood. One of the, the things that uh, I love about this word maturity is really a synonym for it is that someone would become perfect or complete. They're not lacking in any deficient. They're not lacking in an area or deficient in an area, but instead they've reached this place where there's not a point of weakness. Again, I'm not saying we'll ever actually arrive at that end goal here on earth, but that's the, the striving force between why we want to focus on maturity. So as we think about ministry in the church, we need to focus on those types of things that are going to help us be at a place where we are not deficient in a certain area. First thing I think of when I think practically, what does that look like? It's having relationships of accountability. It's having relationships where we are investing in one another and where we allow each other to speak into our life. When you see an area in my life where I am not reflecting Jesus to speak the truth in love, as we'll say, we'll mention in just a moment, and help me to come to that place where 
this is an area where I am lacking. I'm not complete. I have not reached maturity in this. How can I help each other? How can we help each other grow to that place where we are whole and complete? And again, our ministry focuses and what we are contributing to need to be directed at that goal. The last thing, and this is really, I think, what sums up what our goals need to be and where we need to head within ministries is just this statement, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's kind of a, a mouthful of uh, <laughs> what, what that means, but really uh, to maybe simplify as for that, the goal of all of our ministries is that we would be more like Jesus. We'd be more like him. That everything that we do, everything that we're contributing to within our church would help each person in our church grow up to be more like Jesus. In our words, in our action, in the things that we prioritize, in every part of who we are as individuals and as a church, that we would be more like Jesus. So we think about those ideals, those goals, that we want to grow in unity. We want to grow in the knowledge of God. We want to grow in maturity and becoming more like Jesus. We really need to think, okay, are the things that we are doing as a church, the ministries that we offer, whether it be children's or students or men's or women's, the specific ones, our Saturday breakfast, our, uh, again, Bible studies that we do, uh, whatever those things might be, are those ministries, those things that people contribute to, are involved in, partaking in, are they accomplishing these goals? Are these even the focus behind why we are doing these ministries? Okay. As leaders in the church, we need to equip and prepare the saints to do the hands and feet work of these things. But if we're off topic altogether and we're focused on things that are not the end goal of what they need to be, then we need to assess and really change our way of thinking. And so just even personally, thinking about the ministries that you're involved in, is your contribution within those ministries helping to accomplish these goals, helping to our, our church to be more unified, helping our church to grow in our knowledge of God, helping our church to be at a place where we are becoming more and more like it needs to be the thing that we are striving after. I put on here at the very end uh, a good off, or the, how do I put that? Here we go. Offense is the best defense. Okay. Some people would flip that around, but I think in this passage, this is a true statement. Football analogy number three for today. Um, verse 14 says, after all of these ideals, after the, the things that we should strive for within ministry, says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. As we grow in these ideals, as we grow to be at a healthier place in our church with the things that we're contributing to individually and collectively, we are protected, we are sheltered from being led astray to things that are going to be empty the things that are going to deceive us from things that are going to distract and ultimately tear us down and put us in a place of uh, illness. So as we pursue these things, in reality, I think this is a true statement. As we pursue what we should do, the things that would be a temptation to not do become more and more insignificant. And we're at a healthier place because of that. Lastly, uh, how can we as a church grow to be at a healthy spot in relation to ministry Here's, here's a, a tough one. When people move beyond criticism to contribution. When people move beyond criticism to contribution. Let me read what the text says. Verse 15. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul, as he wrote this, kind of ends this section again by emphasizing as the church, we need to speak the truth to one another in love. Okay? There are times that... Uh, it is going to be difficult to speak what's true to each other. There's many times where it's going to be difficult to truthfully say what needs to be said 
And it's even more difficult to really factor in how can I say this in a loving way? Husbands and wives, you can think of this pretty easily, can't you? There's times in your marriage you need to speak what's true to your spouse. To do that with love, it's hard. There's times that uh, it's better to not say something, and there's times when you need to, and it takes discernment, and it takes wisdom, and it takes practice to get to a place where we do that well. But we are called as a church, as the body of Christ, when we think of this idea of ministering, of contributing, that there's times we need to speak the truth. We need to speak it in love. I, I hear often, and I can truthfully say, I was praying about this this week, that God would just check my heart and so when I say this, I, I don't want it to come across from any sort of place of bitterness because I can truthfully say it's not where it comes from. But there's many times I look back, even just being here over six years, where people will bring up a cr- criticism, a critique, and say, why are we doing that? Or that doesn't seem like that's working well. Or uh, this doesn't seem like uh, a wise use of this. Or they bring up some sort of criticism, and it stops it. They might have the right sentiment, they might have the right ideal, and maybe even from their perspective, they might even have the right heart behind it. But if it stops at criticism, it's only going to lead to a place of discouragement. For them to a degree, because if the person they're speaking to doesn't understand and there's not an opportunity to make progress forward, then things probably aren't going to change, which is going to be discouraging because they feel like they voiced something and nothing happened but it definitely will be a discouragement to the person that it's spoken to. Because all they hear is a critique and there's no uh, affirmation for what's actually happening. And so my encouragement is we need to speak what is truthful, but we need to do it in love. We need to think through as we evaluate our church, and I even hope today we are in a place of evaluating, are we contributing holistically to the things that are going to help us be at a healthy place as a church. And if you're here and you're thinking to yourself, man, this really is an area that we are going in a way that does not seem healthy, I would encourage you, we need to speak that out. Okay? But how you go about it, when you go about it, and all those other factors of what you choose to communicate and how you do that is incredibly important. If it stops at just, I'm concerned about this, but there's not a thought of, maybe here's what we could do differently. Here is what I would be willing to do to help bring about some change in that. Here's what I would be willing to do to contribute to making this be at a healthier spot. I guarantee you, someone who is in a leadership role and hears that is going to be far, I I would almost say they're going to be encouraged because they know that the person is engaged in what's happening. They have a heart to move forward to a healthier spot. And the person isn't just critiquing, but they're willing to contribute to that end as well. A church that is defined by that, where people speak what is true, they do that in love, and last part I have on there, and they do their part to help bring that to fruition, that is a healthy church. That's a church that doesn't just let things continue that maybe they're secretly concerned about. It's a church that doesn't just let things persist um, because, you know, to talk about it would be awkward. To talk about it would be something that uh, would put me in a position that I feel uncomfortable with. I had a great example this last week in a positive sense of someone who came to me and was sharing a concern about something and they genuinely wanted the ministry that they were talking about to succeed. They genuinely wanted it to be at a place that it was going to be dynamic and thriving, but they didn't know, how, how can I contribute to that? What can I do to help? I want this to be at a better place. I, I think it could be. I have this ideal. I don't really know what I should do or what I should say or how I can go about it. Okay. To me, that's encouraging, though, because their heart was at a place, I want our church to be healthier. Okay? I want to help, but I'm not sure how. And it was a great opportunity for me to talk with this individual just to say, let's pray about this. Let's think through, you know, what could you do personally to contribute to this? How could you voice this to the people who are overseeing that? A much healthier spot than simply raising something without giving thought to how it could improve and how God could use that in a better way. 
church, I gave some uh, application for you just at the bottom of the page. My encouragement, even today, this week, take some time to think through and pray about what is your role here at FBC? How has God gifted you? Uh, Who is someone you could talk to maybe to give you even some perspective on that? Maybe if you're here and you're like, I have no idea how I fit in. I have no idea uh, how God could use me here. I have no idea, based off my skills and passions and desires, how that carries over into ministering here in the church. Uh, Talk to somebody. Ask someone to give some perspective, some affirmation of what that could look like. Can I encourage you, as we think about moving forward, how can each person in our church holistically, all that they are, contribute to what God would desire for us to do. What does that look like? I I speak that from a place, (laughs) it's always kind of awkward as a pastor to do that. You know, I'm begging you to serve more. That's not at all what I'm saying. But just if we're going to be faithful to what the Word of God says, it says very clearly, when each part is working properly, the body grows. Many in here, and I, I, many of us, and we can praise God for this, can think of the story of Dylan Lyon right now and just how his body has been at a place where parts have not been working properly for a long time now. And I know many of you are going through health difficulties. There's parts of your body that are not working as they used to and as they should, and you experience the ramifications of it. Our church is going to be healthy and growing. It takes contribution. Knowing what my role is in the first place, fully engaging in that and pursuing that the way God wants me to. When I don't know what that is or I see maybe another area that could use improvement, I still think through, okay, how can I help get that to a place where we are whole and healthy and going where God wants us to? That's my prayer for our church. That's what I've been praying this last week. And I I hope that we can, as a whole, be healthy. So would you pray with me? Uh, God, we, we love you. We thank you for this morning. Thank you for what your word says. Uh, thank you, God, for the health we do see in our church. Thank you that uh, there are many areas of ministry, individually and collectively, and just focuses, Lord, that are going well, and we see fruit. We see places that uh, people are responding to Christ. We see places where people are taking steps forward. Thank you last week for Ariana and Emily getting baptized, Lord. We see fruit and we're excited about that. But God, we humbly recognize we need to still be at a healthier place. So Lord, I pray for my heart and everyone here. God, help us to know what can I do to contribute. Purify our heart, God, to think through what our reasons are behind that. God, give our church, I pray for our leadership at our church, give us clear vision to know how our ministries, again, individually and collectively, head towards the goal that you have in mind for us. God, help us all to, again, be equipped and be ready and be obedient, God, to use all that you've given us, Lord, for your purposes. God, would you energize us to that, excite us to that, help us to just have as that ideal in our mind a healthy church God just puts a smile on your heart, puts a smile on your face. It makes you pleased and glorified in that, and we want that. So would you motivate us to that? God, we pray for a great day, and we thank you for our time together in Jesus' name.